The objective of this presentation is to familiarize you with the pathology of inflammatory myopathies. But before that, I would like to briefly take you through the nitty-gritty of the basics of muscle biopsy interpretation. I would be starting with the biopsy procedure itself, the do's and don'ts, familiarize you with the stains we use, the basics of how to interpret, and then finally we shall look at the biopsy features in inflammatory myopathies. Let's start with several of the FAQs that all of you usually ask. Should you biopsy? If yes, which is the muscle to biopsy? How big a piece should it be? How is it to be sent? How do you interpret a biopsy? How do you understand a report? And of course, finally, and most importantly, what does it mean to the patient? So let's start with the four steps, which are essentially the guidelines of muscle biopsy. Step one is the most important, which is the patient selection. Step two, selection of the muscle. Step three, the technique of the biopsy. Step four, what are the biopsy procedures that we do in the laboratory when it finally comes to us. Step one, which is the patient selection, is something that clinicians are well versed with. You would choose to biopsy when there is clinical evidence of a muscle disease or there is presence of a systemic disorder that may involve the muscle. Step two, which is the selection of the muscle to be biopsied, is probably the most critical step. As a dictum, remember that the involved muscle should have a power of grade 3 or 4, no more and no less. It should not have been subjected to a needle state, trauma, ENMG and please avoid insertion sites. Now, if the weakness is proximal in distribution, it would be good to choose the quadriceps or biceps. If the weakness is mainly distal, opt for a distal muscle. In chronic disease, choose a moderately affected muscle. In acute disease, choose a more severely affected muscle, but then keep in mind that the power should be grade 3 or 4, no more, no less. If it is asymmetric, you could use an ultrasound or an MRI, which is often used now by many clinicians to choose the site of biopsy, but please limit your choice to familiar muscles. What's next? The do's and don'ts when you do a muscle biopsy. And that's probably the most important message that I would like to drive home. The first is that the size matters. You often ask us what is the size that we want. Remember, just a 2 by 2 centimeter bit is more than sufficient. We don't need large biopsies, almost like excision biopsies. Now, once you get the tissue out, what you need to do is wrap it up in a saline-soaked gauze. But remember that the objective of this is just to keep the biopsy fresh until it reaches the lab. So please do not drown the biopsy in excess saline in your enthusiasm to make sure that the biopsy doesn't dry out. Because if you do this, the excess saline causes a lot of artifacts which can completely hinder interpretation. Now once you've taken the biopsy and wrapped it up in a saline soap gauze, remember the time lag is extremely critical. Do not delay in sending the biopsy to the lab. It is ideal that the biopsy reaches us within minutes, but the maximum time that we can allow is about two to three hours from the time of biopsy. Now the biopsy, like I've said before, please wrap it up in a saline soap gauze. You could take the gauze, douse it in saline, squeeze out the excess saline and drop your muscle biopsy into it, wrap it up, Drop it into a plastic Ziploc cover and this plastic Ziploc cover containing the gauze with the muscle biopsy needs to be dropped into a flask containing ice. Please make sure that the muscle does not come directly in contact with ice. Once you've done that, take the flask and run to your lab. Now once in the lab, there are several techniques that we need to use to optimally read the muscle biopsy. We have the routine histology. This could be done in the fresh as well as muscle biopsies that are fixed in 10% formula. We also have several tests which are much more important than routine histology and that's the enzyme histochemistry. 
the immunohistochemistry, the biochemistry, particularly done for mitochondrial enzyme assays, genetic studies. All of these, the enzyme, has, the last four tests that I have stated, can only be done on a fresh muscle biopsy. Cannot be done in a muscle biopsy that's fixed either in formalin or glutaraldehyde. The only use of biopsy being fixed in glutaraldehyde is to perform electron microscopy. You may be thinking, do we really need to know all this? The answer is yes, because each type of test provides very specific information and this will dictate how useful the final report will be for your patient management. For example, changes in the muscle structure or morphology can be provided by the routine tests done in any lab on formalin fixed tissue. But for determining the functional status of the muscle, the most important test is the enzyme histochemistry because this helps us to assess the mitochondrial function, the myofiber typing and so on. But remember, this can only be performed on fresh muscle. Similarly, advanced tests such as the immunohistochemistry, western blot, which help to assess the various protein expression in the muscle like dystrophin, sarcoglycans and other sarcolemal proteins, which are critical for the diagnosis of muscular dystrophy, is again possible only in fresh muscles. Electron microscopy is useful in evaluating structural changes of subcellular organelles like mitochondria, etc. But then remember that these do not reflect functional alterations in these. So, to summarize, if you send the muscle biopsy in formalin, only routine morphology assessment is possible. All of the other tests, which are very critical for diagnosis of the specific type of muscle biopsy, is possible only in fresh, unfixed muscle. Therefore, the ideal sample is a fresh muscle. But don't ever forget, if you want these tests done, it has to reach the lab, which has a know-how how to do these tests, within one to two hours of biopsy. And why is that? Because once we receive the biopsy, we have to immediately snap freeze it in liquid nitrogen and quickly cut it in a cryostat and carry out the various stains that we have listed immediately before the activity of these enzymes are lost. Only then can we do several of the tests that we have spoken about the enzyme histochemical stains that test the functional status of the muscle, the immunohistochemistry important to identify protein deficiency or protein surplus, the western blot which allows quantitation of individual proteins and so on. But to reiterate, all of these are lost if the muscle is fixed in formalin and these very critical tests then cannot be performed. Let's now look at how the muscle looks under these different stains that we do. This picture here is a muscle stain with the hematoxylin eosin stain. In this, you can see all of the myofibers are stained a pretty pink. Each fiber is typically polygonal, packed back to back within the fascicle, with its nuclei, which you are seeing as blue dots, arranged all along the periphery of the border of each fiber. Now, these myofibers together form a fascicle and the border of each fascicle has a band of connective tissue which is called the perimysium. It is along this perimysium that the blood vessels enter into the fascicle to supply each individual myofibre. The enzyme histochemistry helps evaluate the internal structure of each myofibre the fiber types, the metabolic state of the myofibril, its enzyme activity and so on. None of this can be seen in the hematoxylin eosin stain which is done on formalin fixed tissue because this destroys all enzyme activity because formalin cross-links 
the protein. This slide here lists the various enzyme stains which we do. This includes the ATPA stain which helps to differentiate the type 1 and type 2 myofibers, the oxidative enzymes which include NADH, SDH and the cytochrome oxidase or COX for short. Then comes the all-time favorite, the modified Gomori trichrome. There are then several other tests that are performed only when indicated. For example, if you are suspecting a glycogen storage, then we do what's called a PAS stain or the perized dick acid skiff stain. If a lipid storage is suspected, we do an oil red stain and so on. Of the oxidative enzymes, the SDH or the succinate dehydrogenase stain is specific for mitochondria. You can see here a muscle which is stained for the succinate dehydrogenase stain shows a very nice checkerboard pattern of dark blue and light blue fibers clearly showing you that the dark fibers which are the type 1 fibers are richer in mitochondria. A very similar pattern is also seen with the NADHTR stain because this also stains the mitochondria but in addition it also labels the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The COX or the cytochrome oxidase is again used to look at the mitochondria and shows darker type 1 fibers because of its higher content of mitochondria and the lighter type 2 fibers. But it's the ATPA stain which is the most beautiful stain which very clearly can distinguish the type 1 and the type 2 fibers. It is usually performed in two different pH. The top panel shows you an ATPase done at an alkaline pH of 9.4 where the type 2 fibers are seen as darker and the type 1 fibers are light and this is reversed when we do an ATPase at an acidic pH of 4.4. Note that in a normal muscle there is a checkerboard pattern which is maintained by which we mean that the type 1 and the type 2 fibers alternate with each other. In this slide, you can see a muscle biopsy which is stained for the modified Gomori trichrome stain. This is most useful to identify three specific features. The ragged red fibers that you are seeing on the top panel on the right side, which is very characteristic of mitochondrial myopathies. In the lower panel, you can see the nimaline rods which are seen as red needle-shaped inclusions like a cap below the sarcolemma of each myofiber. And of course, the rimmed vacuoles, wherein each vacuole is outlined by this red granular material and this is a frequent feature that you see in inclusion body myocytes.